Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Laura Heinrich and I lead digital marketing for GE Power Digital. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, the topic for today's session is turning the tables on cyber attacks and industrial systems. This broadcast is part of a four-part webinar series on the topic of digital across the electricity value network. Now, many of you attended our last session where we gave a deep dive on the use of analytics for asset reliability. I wanted to let you know a recording of that session is now available on the same registration page for this webinar. And by the way, a recording of this session will be posted there as well. We will be taking questions toward the end of the session, but feel free to type your question in the Q&A box at any time during the broadcast. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. We are so pleased to have three experts in the science of combating cyber attacks, specifically in the power industry. Uh, first, we'll hear from Mike Asante, the Director of Critical Infrastructure and Curriculum Lead for the Science Institute. Mike is also the Director of Critical Infrastructure and co-founder of Next Defense, an ICS security company. He served as Vice President and CSO of NERC, where he oversaw industry-wide implement implementation of cybersecurity standards. Next, we'll hear from Rob Gary, Executive Chief Engineer, Controls and Product Cybersecurity here at GE Power. Uh, Rob has worked in control systems engineering since joining GE in 1991. From his early days, leading the development of advanced controls for gas turbine low emission systems, to currently where his focus is on cyber and the GE Power Engineering Organization, Rob's expertise lies in control platform development, field commissioning, unit operability, product, cyber, and advanced applications for the power industry. Following Rob, we'll hear from another Rob, Rob Putman, the GE Power Digital Cyber Commercial Lead. Now, Rob Putman has over 15 years' experience ranging from launching new security products at companies like HP to instituting secure SCLC practices at companies such as Success Factors and Yahoo. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike, to begin. Well, thank you very much, Laura. I appreciate it, and I'm very glad to be here. Uh, today, I would like to talk to everybody about an exciting time. That's the age of automation and analytics. Uh, so it's an exciting time to be working in the automation space and particularly looking at challenges, operational challenges, such as cybersecurity. Now, first of all, um, we're in this uh, place where the benefits are very real. When you start adding the idea that every business is a data-driven business and you use that model, very quickly by the implementation of technology, you can see 12 to 20% productivity gains in, in, in the processes you already operate and own. Not only are the benefits very real, but so are the stakes. They're high. Uh, I like to consider digitization as a very important benefit that we need to walk into, but eyes wide open. It is a double-edged sword. How so? Well, in two dimensions. Uh, number one, there's expanding digital touch points as we start to innovate in this matter. Uh, and the other area, of course, is a growing reliance on that automation that we're implementing. But I believe innovation done correctly can really reduce the security risk that we face. So today, I'd like to talk to you about a concept I call digital ghost. It's a label that I'm giving uh, to an approach that goes far beyond traditional cybersecurity to apply the new innovations in model-based and analytic and predictive systems applied in such a way to help you reduce risk in the security dimension. The concepts to be presented here may inform future development and innovation. And I think you're going to hear from GE, they're doing some exciting things in this dimension. So we'll also talk about the maturity curve, where you are today, how do you climb that curve in the traditional cybersecurity sense. But let's focus on turning the tables on the attackers. So let's describe, if you will, the state of play. Um, I believe in a very uh, positive way that defenders actually have an advantage. I think the defender's greatest strength is their knowledge of the industrial processes and assets that are under their control. Together with their partners and defenders are often creators of the chessboard of which the cyber contest is going to be played out to its conclusion. Designing and engineering the game board, if you will, can inform you of your opponent's possible moves and can position you to turn the tables on them. The simple idea here is to use your deep knowledge of both the industrial process 
and the complex machines under control to devise new ways of sensing attacker experimentation or early actions when they potentially could be developing a concept to launch an attack. So let's also look at where we find ourselves today in the world of cybersecurity. There would be great uncertainty and some confusion. Recent revelations of malware infections, even in very well-protected, high-security architected places like commercial nuclear power plants, demonstrates the shortfalls of a prevention-only security strategy. Building walls isn't going to get us into tomorrow. What we've learned from a series of cybersecurity incidents are that, number one, perimeter defenses are necessary, but they're insufficient by themselves. You absolutely will be breached if you haven't already been breached. Most organizations are actually unable to detect more sophisticated intrusions, especially those that rely on zero-day type exploits or common practices but use stealthier techniques in terms of their ability to uh, harvest credentials and operate within the target's environment. Intruders may compromise your systems for more than a year until you've been alerted that they exist. We call that attacker free time. Although we've seen some reduction in that, we're still measuring it mostly in months or weeks. And finally, you're more likely to be notified of a breach by a third party than your own security operations teams in some situations. So if you think about these, this is, it seems extremely challenging of what we're learning from the type of breaches that we've been studying in the past couple of years. Now, target attacks, which are very different than unstructured non-target attacks coming from the Internet, have very real consequences associated with them, and they've been on the rise in energy infrastructures around the globe. In 2015, it brought with us a very public cyber campaign that resulted in power disruptions and critical attacks uh, that crippled and used and impaired supervisory control and data acquisition systems on three different distribution utilities within Ukraine. One year later, same time frame in December of 2016, a specific cyber attack caused a successful outage at the transmission level and transmission level substation within Ukraine as well. The attackers are proved to be adept at using power system automation to their advantage before launching a series of destructive attacks designed to deny the use of these important tools in your ability to restore the system or restore power. These attacks illustrate the danger of allowing attackers both access and intimate knowledge of your industrial processes for too long. The more time they have to learn your systems and learn about what they possibly could do to operate against your systems, the greater the risk to the enterprise or organization operating those systems. What I've learned from attackers by studying their incidents uh, and looking at their trade trade craft and skills is that a growing number of these cyber attacks are actually honing their skills and taking hard-fought lessons learned in execution of attacks and applying those to become very good at, A, intruding upon our systems, and burrowing very deep enough to exercise what I call a freedom of movement and freedom of action. They get themselves into a position where they can move into different segments and networks, and they have a freedom of action of what they're able to do. Today's attackers have demonstrated that they are goal-oriented, number one. They start with the why. What am I here for? They expend intellectual energy to develop a plan. They exercise patience and adapt to challenges that they encounter in the target system and they tend to actually test their capabilities to successful include, uh, uh, and, then, and they take pride in executing and executing well. These habits combined with the luxury of choosing their targets, the place of attack and the time of attack have resulted in many cybersecurity experts declaring that attackers have the superior advantage over defenders. This is certainly true if the target is ill-prepared and does not anticipate or mitigate these types of attacks, but I have a more optimistic outlook. First, let's talk about a model that we've developed. Now, the first part of this model is actually a model developed by the Lockheed Martin organization called the Cyber Kill Chain. The stage one model applies to a normal IT environment. Attackers go through a certain sequence of steps and have to apply capabilities and skills during those steps to be successful. It begins with planning, preparation, developing a concept to conduct a cyber intrusion, delivering that capability, If they achieve success, they'll install software, they'll use native tools on boxes, they'll modify things in order to position themselves to be able to move further. They will set up a command and control architecture so they can manage the interactions between themselves and their target environments, and they'll sustain their attack with follow-up with the ability to act. 
In many cases, this model grew off of a lot of espionage-focused attacks where information and data was the objective of the attacker to be stolen. This model works very well to inform you of how to structure your defenses, how to increase your capabilities to detect and respond in what you're looking for. However, in industrial environments, it's necessary to expand this model, and this is that stands what we call the ICS kill chain. Stage two is the expansion of the model that once an adversary is intruded upon a network and gathered certain tools and information such as credentials, which would allow them access then to deliver themselves into an industrial environment, and usually requires defeating some enforcement technologies and security technologies to do that, but that can be done and has been done. The idea is they have to go through additional steps in order to uh, have outcomes that we're seeing, things like develop a concept to act or attack that environment. They'd have to tune that concept to get it right, in many cases, because it's an industrial environment and process, they'll have to validate or verify or test that they can actually change set points, for example, to manipulate a process or have an effect. Then they have to position their ICS attack by delivering it, usually installing software or changing set points, like modifying configurations or data, and executing the attack. The execution could come with three major steps typically we find. Something might enable the attack, meaning putting the process in a condition which allows consequences they're trying to achieve to occur. They initiate the actual attack with the specific modification of a set point, for example, or data, or injecting a command. And finally, sometimes because it takes time to play out in physics in the real world, they have to support that attack by either spoofing or fooling the DCS, for example, the control system in place, or the operators in the control room with, with uh, either replaying known good data while the process is being manipulated. This is what we call an exaggerated kill chain. In that exaggerated kill chain, there's opportunities by the defenders in order to be able to identify, detect, and disrupt the attacker. So let's talk about flipping the coin on primacy. A defensible environment with well-trained defenders can make a good contest of a challenge against attackers. I agree with that 100%. But as our reliance on digital technology grows, it comes with imperative that defenders not only catch up with attackers, but have the ability to leap ahead of them to safeguard the value that they're creating with all this new technology. Think of this as an opportunity to maximize the advantage of deep process and system and machine knowledge and harness it to provide a labyrinth of unobservable sensors able to detect suspicious changes in the environment. Leveraging the intelligence of the system can drastically increase the difficulty for the attacker of planning and executing an impactful attack. So by using cognitive learning engines or precise machine models, we can harness already existing instrument-driven measures to identify attempts to manipulate changes, make minute small changes based on that kill chain we talked about. These techniques are already proving to be successful in advanced prognostic applications. We're talking about using that capability to think about security implications. Here's the premise. When we leverage that intelligence of a system, we can drastically increase the difficulty of planning and executing attack, as we discussed. The digital ghost concept, using measurements to detect the process and machine changes, would look for sensing opportunities that go beyond traditional networks or host-based security monitoring. So we're going beyond cyber here. The process, its instruments, actuators, and greater ICS could be analyzed by system designers and owners working with the original equipment manufacturers for particular machines and implementations to determine what sensing data defenders can use to identify attacker experimentation or actual attempts to change set points and provide dangerous commands out of sequence, for an example. Let me give you a few real-world examples of how to do this, but first, I just want to reiterate, in the cybersecurity world, we're good at getting information from what I call cybersecurity signatures, like endpoint security systems, or network-based IDS, and looking at sometimes ICS networks and applications or host behaviors. This is the domain that we've operated in to detect suspicious activity. One could argue we're maybe not going far enough to monitor ICS networks and network traffic, but this is the area that we've been confined or thinking to. What I'm suggesting is we expand to looking at process behavior itself, what the instruments can tell us of what's occurring, and even measure and understand physical outcomes to changes in the process. By expanding up, just like safety, we'll have a more holistic view of what's happening in the industrial environment. So, digital ghost as a concept would have several attributes. By using this data, it comes with the industrial process, 
tied directly to machines under control, a defender can add that new dimension of achieving what I'll call a more holistic defense in depth. It's a powerful feat to have a detection system that lies out of the reach or just out of the attacker's real-time perception, unlike an inline security solution that can be seen by an attacker, or sometimes kind of like passive taps that we use on the network, which gives the ability to collect data and leaves the attacker wondering whether their actions are being observed or not. In this case, it's coming from the instruments. There are some architecture options where instruments can dual report measurements to provide a method for sensing and analyzing data out of band from the targeted ICS. Our current IT-centric cyber detection strategy rely only on host or network provided data to provide security decision making. We use filters and rules and heuristic determinations. A digital ghost concept would take data from the process itself and the machines under control to determine whether malicious operators or programming has been identified to try to modify the process or have an effect. The attributes would include it would be stealthy, it would be proactive since it's actually actively looking at suspect conditions, it had a very strong detective capability to identify changes, and it could be adaptive in terms of the information or the logic that you apply to the changes being observed, meaning you could actually heal or take uh, the correct, uh, corrective actions to either put a machine back into a safety envelope or to make a good decision about shutting down a process that might be being manipulated. So let me give you two quick examples. One would be an overwatch system. In this, quick, in this case, a cognitive engine or an implementation of a more direct rule-based filter would allow an overwatch system that's monitoring something like system state to detect malicious operations of several remotely controlled circuit breakers over a short period of time. You see, power system operations other than rem remedial action schemes or special protection schemes rarely require opening circuit breakers rapidly across multiple substations. We just don't do that. An overwatch system could be used in the case of the December 23, 2015 Ukraine distribution attacks, uh, where the attackers hijacked the SCADA system and began to remotely operate circuit breakers to cause power disruptions. They did so in such a, a sequence and in such large numbers that any type of an overwatch system could potentially suggest, as they're getting a feedback loop from the front-end processor, that either A, we should nullify all these commands and break the chain, or B, maybe sandbox the commands and ask the supervisors for review to suggest you really want to do this uh, because it doesn't match the operating profile of a SCADA DMS system. And in the example of Ukraine in this case in 2015, we had an outage that affected a large number of customers in three different service territories uh, across three different types of SCADA DMS technology. The attackers figured out concepts to operate to open up remotely controlled circuit breakers impacting over 50 substations to cause an outage of uh, load being served about 135 megawatts. So that was the event. An overwatch system would suggest that the systems were being misoperated in a manner you wouldn't expect routine utility operations to occur. Another example might be a spoofing or replay attack example. A common attacker tactic is in that part of lying to the system, lying to the ICS and the control room operators must spoof data coming from PLCs. This type of attack can be difficult if it's carried out in too many places. Consider the line used in the replay attack by Stuxnet, where in this case they replayed known good, you know, what things look like during operations while they were actually attacking the process, so control room operators couldn't see that machines were being driven out of their specs. A system recording was being replayed back to the human machine interface, showing equipment process operating under normal conditions. Well, uh, adapt a system like this that could be looking at data coming from the instruments themselves would tell you for sure that there was a mismatch, that what the HMI was receiving was not what was occurring and what the instruments were telling operators, almost as an off-system view, and a logic engine could be applied to that. Those are just two quick examples. Well, I believe that we can really innovate a brighter future. Every automation system owner should be striving to reduce complexity and unwieldy <coughs> integration. The hallmark of a highly reliable system is for engineers and operators to possess a comprehensive understanding of how the system operates and what constitutes expected behavior in normal communications. That's an area that we all can improve upon. However, I see a big opportunity in the area of leadership and innovation. Leadership in today's digital market favors those who can see beyond the immediate application of any specific solution to drive greater systemic value all the time while addressing the inherent risk that comes with a smaller, more connected world. 
Let's innovate a brighter and more secure future. And for that, I'd like to turn it over to Rob Gary to talk specifically about taking concepts like digital ghosts and making them real. Rob? Thank you, Mike. Um, let, me, let me move the slides forward here. So first of all, critical infrastructure, uh, owners and operators of power plants, it's not a question of if but when. As Mike clearly articulated, you will be breached. Um, a recent survey amongst 25 operators within our fleet, 96% of them had at least one system with a vulnerable operating system. 92% of them had a, a system with an expired endpoint solution. 95% had dual home systems. Um, these are the things we're seeing at a power plant level. And although the, the cyber word is getting out to the corporate levels, it's still not down where it needs to be in the, in the operator's plants. So, and, and the part that really scares me is you're going to be the last to know. Um, these, these attackers go into systems and reside there undetected. So let's talk a little bit about what they do while they're undetected. First of all, they can move throughout your system. This takes them from IT networks to OT networks to critical operational data. They can plan attacks, and that's what they do. In the coordinated attack of the Ukraine, or Ukraine event that Mike referred to, this was three different sites, three different facilities where uh, operational information was collected and the attacks were uh, executed within a 15-minute period across different parts of the country. And, and this coordination across locations is really the next wave of, of attackers' realm that, that scares us. Um, the Stuxnet example has been told before, and, and some may or may not be familiar with it, so I'm going to take a quick overview of, of what I like about the, um, the parallels here, and then, of course, talk about a, a little different perspective how we look at it. I like to call this the trifecta attack. This was an IT intrusion across an air gap network. Um, operator or uh, technicians that had worked at other facilities nearby picked up the malware and brought it into the air gap facility. The second part was it was an OT expertise. They got into the uh, PLC or industrial control system. And then the third level was domain expertise. Um, this facility in uh, the Nantan's uranium enrichment facility in Iran had over 4, 000, has over 4,000 um, cylinders that are part of these centrifuge technologies. Within those cylinders, is a carbon fiber body that spins at a very high frequency. So the attacker's goals were to disrupt the nuclear program by damaging these, um, these centrifuges. And, and this attack took years in the planning stage. And it's what we, uh, what we call in engineering a test and learn environment, where the attackers came in, took an approach, learned, and then altered their approach, not unlike you would design a piece of new equipment. Moving to the right side of the slide, uh, the part that's very interesting here is the first planned attack was to damage the centrifuges by altering the pressure in the in the bodies. So this is a series of valves controlled by a PLC, locking over pressure valves and, and, and trying to oscillate this pressure. But the result was it didn't work. So while they went un the attackers went undetected, they collected information and went back for a second try that did work. That second try was varying the frequency through the electric drives across the critical operating point of the body of the centrifuge. And then not only finding the critical speed, but then locking it. And on that locked rotor at a critical speed, it would create cracks that would lead to later failure. Um, this went on for an extended period of time without root cause, thought to be infant mortality or just other failures of the centrifuge until it was turned over that it was a, was a hacking event or um, a cyber activity. And, and just further on this, uh, the going undetected was the, the playback mode of, of capturing past events and playing them back on the operator screen. So very difficult to detect. But I like the way Mike words it. We have a defender's advantage when we think about the physics, when we think about the asset. Um, walking the slide from the left, um, operators, G has a fleet of gas turbines that represents thousands of megawatts, thousands of gigawatts, excuse me, and these are under monitoring and diagnostic view. So we look at the fleet, we have a lot of experience at looking at anomalies in, in vibration, in parts life, in wear. We've been doing this for a long time. 
So when we look from the left, it's the scale. Now let's go to the right side of the slide and, and look the other way. We have a lot of design expertise. There's uh, thousands of man hours in, in research and development that goes into developing the physics of how these turbines work. And that's the expertise. So when you bring these two elements together um, by understanding your physical asset, understanding what you do, you clearly have the defender's advantage. It's extremely difficult to model, duplicate, um, create playback modes, or even find the failure modes that couldn't be detected when you combine these two capabilities. So let's start at what I showed on the right side of the slide. Uh, a gas turbine represents 250 megawatts today, maybe more in some of the larger units, uh, less in the, in the peakers. It's enough electricity for over a quarter of a million homes. This is a 170 ton rotor spinning at 3,600 3, or 3,000 RPMs in the middle of the machine. This is a lot of entrained mass, and, and it's a, a very um, physics-based design. So moving to the right-hand side of the slide, um, this is some of the, the design that goes into it. A combustor is a, a simple device where air and fuel mix, burn, and release heat. But the, the design that goes into that, the, the magic, the intellectual property, and the ability to mix these ratios correctly to get low emissions and high performance, is a, it's an art form that, uh, that a lot of technology is based on. Um, let's move to the blade. Um, this blade is, could sit on your coffee table, but it represents, just for reference, six, seven hundred horsepower of energy into this unit. And there's, you know, hundreds of these blades around the four stages of the turbine. Again, a lot of science, a lot of understanding what's happening there. And finally, um, as I mentioned, a, 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 turb, a gas turbine converts fuel and air into uh, electrical energy. Well, the air side of this is the compressor. No less a design challenge, no less modeling, or no less physics behind it. We combine that with the hundreds of sensors of the turbine that are shown on the left side of this that measure temperatures, measure pressures, measure velocities, and we have a very complex system that's understood and capable of, of demonstrating the, the type of behavior and the type of modeling we want to see. So now let's go to the innovation. This is where the physics meets the asset. This is the defender's advantage. Um, the, top, the top four boxes here are a very simplified view of what, what some call the, um, the closed loop control or the Purdue model of, of control systems. Um, we'll walk it from the left. The turbine or asset um, receives commands that come back around from the right. Um, the operability of the turbine is picked up on air sensors, fuel sensors, pressure sensors, as we discussed in the previous slide. Um, this is fed into an industrial controller that runs on algorithms that, that then issue commands to actuators for the fuel and air to the unit. It seems simple here, but the complexity of how this is put together is a, is a well-tuned a well -tuned orchestra. Moving to my second box on the, on the lower left, um, I refer to this as the, um, the source of truth, and we have this today. This is model-based control. Model-based control is the evolution over the last 10 to 15 years of generic lookup tables that match desired, desired operation to physics-based tables that are multidimensional, truly articulate the physics of the machine, and truly run to those, those boundaries or parameters. So now we take that and we contain that. That becomes our source of truth on what our machines should be doing. The innovation we're discussing today is the next box, as I referred to, is the math engine. Anyone that's worked in a power plant, critical infrastructure area, realizes that with the digital age, more alarms is not what you need. What you need is action and clarity on problems you may or may not have. And, and we're, we're in the midst of, of determining with this box what are the right things to, to alarm? What are the ones not to? With some very complex algorithms in there for what I'm calling detection, not, uh, not alarming. So detection and alerting is where we're going with this. Um, the slide I'm showing now is a, a simple threat simulation of, of one of our threat vectors. 
This is a simulated kill chain example, as Mike showed in the previous one, of how we're working to get our head around what's real, what's not, and how we assimilate the data. On the left side is an actual simulation run on one of our controllers where we alter parameters in the controller and look for signatures that is happening. Um, what this slide simply shows you is an operator screen might not show a simple set point adjustment that's done slowly. Um, a, a, an attacker getting in, adjusting a set point over time may not be detected and likely wouldn't be detected. Now, if we move to the right in this simple example of one of our threat vectors, um, we have what I call the, uh, the red ant. Um, the team working on this at the research center um, would say it's much more than that, which I agree it is, but we're creating a sphere or an operational boundary that's within the acceptable operation of the unit. And inside the boundary, decision boundary we call it, is normal operation. Again, quite complex, much more complex than the speed of a centrifuge, which, which in itself was difficult to detect. This is many, many parameters across the turbine. And when you creep outside this threat space, the hypothesis we're challenging today as we, as we work with these models is how many outside the box should you be concerned about? Is one a bad sensor? Is three multiple bad sensors? Is a dozen the right amount? Well, the answer is it's not that quantitative, and we need the logistics and the thinking that goes around our expertise to do that, making it very real for us, but very challenging for an attacker to reverse engineer, um, spoof, or create a playback scenario on. So my final slide is, is the, the model of how we make this real. Um, Look in the upper left box where I show the physical models. This is where we harbor what we're referring to as the digital ghost. We harbor this expertise. We harbor the models there in the things that we already have. The other threat intelligence that feeds into this might be feeds from Department of Homeland Security or our own um, intelligence center here at GE that's targeting cyber threats and has connections around the world. In that, we also add the physics. Now moving to the, the right in real time is our anomaly detection, which I showed on the previous page. Imagine the operator at a remote facility, um, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and, and he, he or she starts to get alerted. Something might be in awry. Not enough to shut down the turbine, but something that doesn't look right. This drives us to a, a state of heightened alert. Um, call home call operations center, potentially back off load, but don't shut your turbine down. Reliability is a very big deal and we, we can't afford the false positives or the unnecessary scares. Um, however, in this middle box, we're also generating a signature. Take you back to the um, Stuxnet event. Centrifuges were sporadically failing around the facility. Um, there was not the methodology or the, the intelligence to say, hey, these these failures are looking similar. Develop this signature and then go from the physics to the analytics of this anomaly fault detection. If we see this across our, our state, we see this across the fleet, we see this across the city, this could alert a potential nation state. Call your security operations center. Contact Department of Homeland Security. What have you learned? What are you seeing? Um, this is the real-time analysis that we envision here, not unlike how we look at cracks, vibrations, um, deviations from operation in an actual power plant today. But not stopping there, the human in the loop part is the expertise. Drop out of that box to a root cause analysis. Bring in the physical experts, heat transfer, bucket life, combustor, turbine, you know, the things I showed on the previous slide. Where is the deviation? Is it real? As we understand that, we update our threat vectors and feed them back into the physical model. In my mind, creating a scenario that will keep us in the defender's advantage chair and, and never say never, but certainly slow potential attacks and, and put us in a positive position. So I've been excited to share this, um, you know, following Mike's introduction on, on the forward-leaning position here. And, and again, I, I look forward to the question and answer segment as we can further articulate our, our vision here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rob. So we're gonna jump ahead here, maybe, uh, may, well, not lighten the topic a little bit, but let's take a quick poll. 
Um, starting with initial and ending at optimizing on a scale from least mature to most mature. Uh, this is an anonymous poll, so we don't know who you are, who's answering, or where you're from. Um, but what we want to do is, in the name of transparency, see how well your responses to um, this maturity poll map to what we're actually seeing out there in the market. So we'll give you just uh, maybe a little over a minute, if you'll please take the time to, uh, to read through these. Um, I'm going to read through and add a little more description. Uh, initial is essentially in terms of a security program or strategy in your organization. Um, do you have any practices in place? Is someone in charge of thinking about security? Uh, do you update firmware and software from your OEM vendors? Do you have any access control definitions on uh, the edge perimeter of your OT controls environment? Um, to developing, uh, do you have the antivirus endpoint signatures in place? Um, just another layer of control or security in place. Defined, do you have a good sense of, of what you're doing, what you want to achieve, um, what your primary vectors or, or nodes of risk are in your environment? And uh, do you have controls in place and do you actively manage those controls? Um, managed, this is where you start to federate or aggregate or move on to a managed services level. Uh, maybe you have a security operations center, maybe you outsource that functionality to someone else. Um, but this is a real program and you have a real strategy. You've identified your risk and you follow up and manage it proactively. Optimizing, um, gosh, just to, not to be funny, but anyone who's in the optimizing stage, I'd love for you to reach out to me because we wanna know what you're doing and, and commercially we wanna copy that and help others follow your practices. I know there are a few companies out there that I would consider to be in this stage. Uh, oftentimes it's an executive level mandate from the C-level that's essentially we will not be hacked and we will have a very robust program in place. Um, you're out there, uh, there aren't a lot of you, but it's, it's great that you're out there and we wanna know more about your standards. So that's kinda how we're thinking about this, just a simple maturity questionnaire. Um, there'll be real time feedback when I click to the next slide. Uh, we'll probably give you just a couple more minutes um, to think about this, and then we'll switch over. Uh, part of the reason, too, uh, that we want to talk about a maturity curve is that we at GE believe commercially this is the right way to engage the market. Um, so instead of approaching the market with uh, fascinating tools and technologies and selling products, we want to talk about a strategy. We want to talk about the identification of risk, we want to talk about the impact of that risk to your availability and the resilience of your environment, and then talk about how you take tools, practices, services, et cetera, to manage that risk, um, and then continue to develop the program. So hopefully you've all had a chance to vote. Click over. I'm excited to see what the distribution is. Okay? Interesting. A lot of uh, the biggest uh, uh, portion is up in the managed area. Um, others defined developing, working on it, the least number in initial, and uh, and let's see, is that the least 8.1 versus, okay, the least number up in, in optimizing. Okay, this is great. We see uh, slightly different numbers um, with the security health checks and assessments that we're doing uh, globally for customers. Uh, what I would characterize as a bimodal distribution, heavily skewed toward immature. Um, many have something in place, examples being uh, McAfee antivirus in place with their HMI hosts that shipped back in 2007. Uh, the software hasn't been updated, the signatures haven't been updated, and, uh, and malware has been detected and no one's doing anything about it. We've also seen um, some access control issues in place where people have broken what was initially good segmentation for the purpose of, of harvesting uh, historian data, for example, uh, directly from uh, the IT network. And one of the more interesting cases that we saw was a wireless access point uh, with no credentials set up on it in the middle of an OT controls environment. We were able to show the plant manager from uh, a neighboring trailer park that with a laptop anyone could uh, basically connect and see their entire controls environment, anything that had an IP uh, in, that, in those zones um, associated with the wireless access point uh, could be queried and interfaced with to some extent. Solvable problems, and so that's where we put a lot of our focus and emphasis here at GE. Um, this is a little bit more detail. You heard Rob Gary talk about this before. Um, you know, vulnerable operating system, P2 
people are leaving uh, vulnerabilities in their firmware and software hanging out there in a production environment. Anyone with security chops knows that that's a good practice and alleviates a lot of your exposure to risk. Keep your stuff up to date and patched. Um, at least uh, one system with, a, ex with endpoint protection in place, but expired signatures. Uh, user access um, practices. Uh, there was actually a case where an administrative password um, for a system was actually password, and that password had been in place for 12 years. And the only reason we know it was 12 years is that's as long as the employees could remember. Um, so it may have been there longer. So simple password management. And, uh, and don't share them either. Uh, dual homed hosts, we talked about this, breaking good segmentation, introducing additional uh, opportunity for an attacker to, uh, uh, to get into the environment. Um, and then a smaller proportion, but we see uh, malware in the environment that's either effective or not effective. Uh, and, and we haven't seen, this isn't to say that, that it's not there, but we haven't seen in the security assessments that we've done and granted, these are legacy locations, legacy fleet uh, sites. Um, there's no monitoring, no real security monitoring in place. So how are we thinking about this at GE? This is a dramatically simplified picture to a um, capability maturity model. Uh, we tend to uh, gravitate back to a critical security controls approach from the Center for Inter Internet Security in part because it, it kind of describes a path forward for most customers that are at an early stage of maturity and gives some real concrete uh, things to solve, things such as inventorying devices, inventorying software, uh, patch management, keeping things up to date, boundary controls, et cetera, and, and really gets to what we think is an accessibility problem in the market. Um, oftentimes, cybersecurity is is seen as this complicated thing. It's hard to get your head around. And unfortunately, that's a call to inaction. It's a call to not start on something that's really hard and complicated. Whereas you know, some experts, for example, with the Center for Internet Security, would argue if you were to apply five plus basic controls, you could reasonably, um, you could reasonably uh, uh, mitigate upwards of 80 to 85% of your exposure to risk. The, the point being this. Take steps, take basic steps. It's not an all or nothing, but get going on a program. And then the conversation for those in, in sort of the mid-level to higher level is what are the problems you haven't solved yet? And that's where I, as a product manager, and the thinking around digital ghost and this concept of cyber-physical analytics, the ability to identify with certainty um, malicious behavior being directed at your asset, and then ultimately the ability for the control system to heal itself to do what we call accommodation and set itself back or override uh, the malicious parameters that are causing damage to the asset. Uh, and then it's a call to action on the blue team's part to get in there and figure out what's going on. But you've assured availability, provided resilience in the environment, and you bought yourself time to fix the, the root cause and the problems. So our cyber portfolio sort of divided into six categories that really map back to the maturity curve. Um, security assessment services. We've got a broad range of services, everything from a basic zero impact health check, where it's really about coming in and inventorying systems and having a conversation about configurations and uh, known exposures or known vulnerabilities. A good example, when I find a Windows XP Service Pack 2 host, um, it's easy to show someone that a quick uh, Google search reveals not only a juicy le uh, list of vulnerabilities or attacks that can be leveled, but people more than willing to sell you inexpensive toolkits to help you in your effort. Um, all the way up to red team penetration testing and uh, what we call from our, our World Tech acquisition, Achilles certification of, of devices and systems. Um, OpShield is uh, an intrusion detection and prevention solution. It's uh, uh, an OT protocol parsing capability that allows layer seven control. You can whitelist, uh, for example, acceptable commands in a Modbus protocol that can actually be sent down to a control system. Um, a good example being, uh, whether it's the right example or not, uh, you could actually block the restart or shutdown command um, with this tool in line in your controls network. 
Cyber Asset Protection Program, this is a patch validation and, and management program. Um, unfor unfortunately, uh, due to the sensitivity of these environments, you can't just take Microsoft's latest patch and drop it in there and hope it sticks. Uh, it, can't it can't break anything, uh, and so there has to be a validated step, a validation step. For GE uh, HMIs, uh, we offer that service, so uh, on a regular cadence and basis, we provide you the validated uh, patch update software and the assurance that it won't break your, uh, uh, drop your availability or harm your environment. Security ST is an appliance. Um, it's sort of a, a, a universal appliance. It does a number of things. It helps with user identity management, um, with domain controller and active directory. It also helps with SIM, brings in some basic monitoring capability. Someone log into your uh, edge router and make policy changes as an administrator at 1 a.m. in the morning. You might want to know about that. Um, it also automates the patch, uh, patch management uh, capability so you can distribute uh, while the plant is up and running and hot HMI updates um, and gets into backup and recovery. Uh, I often think of, of uh, recovering from a malware or a, uh, um, a malware attack, uh, a ransomware attack where someone's asking you for a million dollars to return control of your dispatched uh, uh, power plant. Well, uh, you can pay that or you can go back to a known good restore point and uh, and thank them very much for their uh, for showing you how they hacked your environment or got in. Um, training, can't underestimate this. You know, you think of the three pillars in security. There's network, applications, and then people. People are often the weakest link. And so we offer training that, that goes from the basics all the way up to, you know, how to configure and manage uh, effective perimeter defenses, um, effectively deploy IDS, IPS solutions, uh, and manage these solutions up to developing your own SOC. Um, but also, most important, training people not to open untrusted attachments, follow untrusted links, um, bring devices into environments that should be quarantined, et cetera, et cetera. Just some really good thinking and getting your people's heads in the right place uh, is the right thing to do. Um, I'll, I'll confess here at GE, we actually have an internal phishing campaign that I've fallen victim to. Um, but the great thing is, is this, it's raised awareness. Something as simple as that is an internal uh, tool that raises the awareness of your employees. They open a, an attachment, follow a link, and get a follow-on email that says, hey, you've just been fished. Please pay attention. Um, since getting caught by that, which is embarrassing, I haven't been caught again. So that's great. Problem, uh, you know, I've been educated. Um, and then managed security services. We see this as, as being an emerging um, capability for GE. Uh, we have some very large global customers asking us to come in and, and think about it, what it might be like to uh, manage their IT and OT combined security operations center. Um, they feel like uh, uh, GE has that capability. It's something we're entertaining. Um, in its most basic form right now, we have the ability to take uh, a number of uh, sources, log event data, and have modeled a number of threat cases and can remotely monitor and, and notify you of any intrusions in your environment. So what's next? Where are we going? Um, two pieces of collateral uh, that really, uh, you know, gets to the <coughs> core of what we're trying to do. If you're early to mid-stage, I would encourage you or, uh, you know, offer you uh, an assessment. Um, we'll have an analyst come on site. It's lightweight. We just want to identify the areas uh, of exposure to security risk and um, show you, not, not just shamelessly show you the tools and things that we can sell you, but show you the controls that you can put in place um, to start or continue to develop your security program. That's the end goal. Um, also, we have some alignment with uh, findings from Department of Homeland Security ICS CERT, uh, where in 2015 there were apparently 296 incidents they responded to and uh, much of it was pretty fundamental stuff. And so they came out, and there's a report um, that's linked in our collateral here uh, that describes seven strategies that can be used to mitigate what they say would have been 98% of, of the, um, the incidents. They also say that the other 2% could have been handled with some really fundamental monitoring. You know, did someone walk in the front door? Did someone do something unexpected in this environment? Uh, the reason we, of course, gravitate to that is 
is we want to make the concept accessible. We go back to that idea of accessibility and the fact that um, the call to action is start doing some fundamental things and they can have very real and significant impact on the ability of an attacker uh, to, to compromise or get in your environment and pull off whatever their agenda is. Um, and underscores the fact that attackers are very dependent upon us making mistakes, upon us leaving these, these vulnerabilities, uh, losing control of credentials, et cetera, making it easy for them, in other words. So that's our thinking. That's the commercial side of things. We're excited about digital ghost, cyber physical analytics, um, number of patents pending in progress, uh, even some funding uh, in collaboration with the Department of Energy um, to build out a pilot site. Uh, when are we going to be uh, commercially available? You know, the usual future-looking you know, product management uh, dismissal or safe harbor statement. Um, you can look to us to, to be making announcements, probably 2018 timeframe. Um, you know, com coming to a security offer offering soon near you, in other words. But hopefully you're as excited about this as, as we are. I think this is the kind of innovation and connection back to just core GE talent and engineering that um, you know you should expect from us. So with that said, let's jump over to Q&A. Very excited to see how people are responding and, and reacting. Great. Sounds good, Rod. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot of questions about um, the digital ghosts and this idea of using data models and cyber detection. Uh, let me just jump in here. Someone asks, um, how <coughs> does this differ from other anomaly-based detection programs for cyber protection? I'm not sure which of you want to jump in on that. Um, Mike, let me, let me that? start with that, and I'm sure there could be some, some good follow-up. Um, the, the simple answer is physics, right? There's a, there's a lot of, of opportunity out there to do this with analytics. Um, picture you bring um, you know you bring Watson from IBM into your power plant and let him sit there for a year. You can learn the behaviors. There's machine learning, but the physics is the is the true the true leap there. Yeah, you know, Rob, I would just add on to that is, you know, I often think of baseline anomaly detection. Right, this isn't baseline anomaly detection. This is a clearly defined model and then an algorithm or math engine that takes outliers and says with a high degree of determination, 99% plus in many cases, that this is a specific effort to manipulate a portion of the physics or the physical asset, uh, degrading its lifespan, for example. And, and that's, that's the big difference there, right? It's not, oops, there's something strange here. It doesn't quite look like what we normally see. It's, there are a combination of strange events that when you put them all together and analyze them, Someone's doing something malicious to this asset. Yeah, okay, physics so, and in, physics and intelligence. So maybe this is a question for Mike, and it goes to sort of what is the level of effort required to develop these kinds of models for the sorts of truth and detection algorithms? Ooh, I actually. Um, so it depends on the process uh, that's uh, that's involved, the target uh, uh, that you're trying to develop, if you will whether that model exists at a certain level, uh, whether the math engine is something that can be put together very easily. Um, what we do find is, when I talked about a multi-layered approach, I gave a few examples which allow you to kind of work with your OEM right away. Examples like in prognostic solutions from a maintenance perspective or system health perspective, we've taken instrument data directly, some of it that would have fed or do, does feed the ICS, and we've used that to feed a different analytic engine, right? We've looked at that data over time and have made observations and good decisions based on that. So just like the idea of that spoofing example I provided, you could actually do it with, very, with little effort by pulling instrument data off core to the DCS, for example, and having that data looked at as a verification or confirmation of system state, <coughs> relative to what the DCS is telling you is one way to defeat or add a tremendous amount of complexity to spoofing. You'd have to spoof deeper in the system, for example, all the way down to maybe before the PLC. That adds a level of complexity even that makes an attacker's job very hard. Um, that wouldn't take a whole lot. When you get into places with very complex machines like the turbines that Rob was talking about, you're into a place where if a well-validated model exists, then it's about building that math engine. So I'd like to turn over to Rob maybe to add to supplement the, the response here. 
Yeah, and I, I it, that's that's perfect, Mike. So the the model I showed was best case, you know, our examples. We worked on those for over ten years, but I could think of a, a um, LNG transfer station where they're where they're loading ships with LNG, driving them through electric drives. Right, that's a different type of model, but it's still a very plausible concept. And that model may reside in the cloud with with different levels of protection on it because. Not because it's less sophisticated, but it's it's not running real time. Um, so also your your scan rates. I mean, the models I showed were running at millisecond frame rate. Um, now let's think about a wind turbine for another example. Wind turbines just spin slower. Again, not less sophisticated. Um, that model may reside upstream of the SCADA system for a wind farm. So it's your it's the order level of your model, first order, second order, in what your asset requires. Perfect. So along the same lines, actually, someone's asking a question about hydro. So the ability to model hydro turbines and those uh, risks associated with that technology. So assume it's a similar response. I guess that would be for Rob G. Yeah, I would say it's a similar response. And in there, you're, you're modeling water flow. I, I, I worked on hydro eight years ago, so I'm not right up to speed, but I think that's more of a first mortar model. But but think of the defender's advantage again. The defender's advantage is your water flows, your gate, um, even even the type of hydro turbine you're using. I mean, you know the physics behind that. Never say never, but it's probably not the first thing an attacker is going to know from from some other region of the world what type of uh, what type of turbine wheel you're using. You know, that's your first order right there. And I I'm, I guarantee you to slow them down. Got it. Good. Thank you. Um, someone asks, uh, many of our plants are running legacy software and hardware due to cost. Is there an opportunity to protect legacy fleet? And are there cost models uh, for security for doing so? But, and Rob P., if you want to take that one. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So that is a big area of, of emphasis. I divide it for, for my own um, intellectual sake into two easy categories. There's everything we do going forward has to have a security story by design to it. I think uh, uh, you know any buyer worth their salt should be asking their OEM, how is this system secure? What, what are your design requirements? How did you think about security and the design of it? And then there's a legacy. I mean, these things were, were designed, these environments were designed with 20, 25, 30, 35 year life cycles. And in large part, that's why um, you know, the life cycle of, of software and some of the control ho environments um, uh, need to be refreshed and updated more quickly than the equipment themselves. So long story short is this. Um, we do have offerings um, that we're building and, and have at present that are relatively platform agnostic and help you get put the, the correct security controls in place to compensate for, uh, for example, the inability to patch or update a system. Maybe the system or underlying operating system is deprecated from the original vendor. There are controls that you can put in place, um, all the way up to even uh, uh, attractive um, uh, control system uh, evergreen or obsolescence programs. That's another way that you can work with a, a vendor is to upgrade uh, the underlying control systems and get into a program where you keep them fresh. So there, there are a lot of approaches, and yes, commercially we can, we can help cost that out. Um, and and in, in part of our security assessments as well, uh, what you find isn't just the shameless promotion of our tools and practices, but just identification and recommendations on the controls that you can put in place, and then you can go source and cost yourself. Perfect. Uh, we probably have time just for one more quick question. This is uh, we haven't really touched on this topic, and it's compliance. And maybe, Mike, if you want to take this, you know, as a multinational power provider, how do I develop a standard security program which is resilient and also meets compliance standards? Mm, it's a great question. Um, as you know, we're seeing cyber laws and regulations in different geographic uh, uh, markets, if you will, uh, coming into their own. The good news is much of that law and regulation have a common basis. Things like Rob talked about, the critical security controls. Working off the fundamentals of how systems are compromised and what security controls provide some additional values typically acts as a common baseline in many of those laws and regulations. 
Some will have different uh, specifics around reporting incidents, those types of things. So there's a common base. Um, regulation is one of those uh, areas when you get into industrial applications, based on the function and the security objective, what you're trying to do with the standard, for example. For the NERC standards, they're focused on the bulk electric system. Therefore, what they protect and how they recommend going about developing the protections at different levels is based on protecting the system. An organization might have its own goals related to specific assets from a commercial perspective they're protecting, and also more overarching resilience goals, for example. So what I recommend is uh, not only understanding the mapping and what the baseline security capability an organization wants to have that should comply with the standards they're held to, but also being able to expand and apply that capability to assets not covered by standards or regulations specifically, if it's in the interest of the organization or the overall larger maybe systemic risk that's just not in the spirit of the regulation. So organizations need to conduct a mapping exercise. They need to have separate compliance activities to know specifically what they're being held to, but they should come up with their own strategy for understanding the consequences associated with their industrial processes and assets by doing more consequence-based assessments and evaluations and making smart, informed engineering and technology decisions to achieve reliance objectives. I think that's, it's great that people are asking this question and it's absolutely how I develop a strategy. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, we're at the um, top of the hour. I'd like to thank our three speakers, Mike, Rob, and Rob, and thank you everyone who joined today. The recording of this session will be available on the registration website. Thank you and have a great day today.